Chapter 1 Release your dogs, the referee said, as the men in the corners let go of their pit bulls. Standing on one side was of the wooden box ring was South Carolina native, Garrod Brown. He had tight-bred Chinaman dog Rex that had won two matches already and was going for his championship win. Solid black with just one speck of white in his chest, Garrod Dog was screaming to get loose before the ref gave the release command. On the opposite side of the ring was a guy from northern North Carolina that had a champion dog with a well-known reputation. A 50-50 cross between Tombstone and Bolio. A razor-sharp, well-conditioned pit name. Freddy wiggled in his owner's hands as he wanted to be released. Eyes wide open as the dogs met in the middle of the ring like two Amtrak trains, the spectators begin to choose sides. Fighting at 47 pounds for the first time, Rex took hold of Freddy's front leg near his ankle. Garrod normally matched Rex at 44, but felt like he could handle a 45-pound pit just as easy as the 44. And for the first five minutes, Rex was barreling into the shoulders and chest of the Bolio dog. The guy that handled Freddy was rather quiet at first, as it seemed his hound had finally met his match. But at about the seven-minute mark or the fight, Freddy took a devastating hold of Rex back end. That's when his handler got on his knees and began to coach him. While pointing at Rex's kidney area, the handler got Freddy to take a gigantic bite into his side. Rex squealed in pain as Freddy shook his head with all of his strength. Realizing he was hurt, Freddy attempted to finish Rex off as he quickly shifted his grip to the lower neck area. Garrod never saw Rex being beat in this manner as Freddy took what looked to be a death grip on Rex's throat. With $10,000 on the line, Garrod didn't want to pick his dog up and save his life, so he left Rex down in the center of the square ring to die. Holding a tight grip as Rex laid lifeless in his jaws, Freddy Handler came up behind him as he pried his jaws loose with a plastic breaking stick. Picking him up and removing him from the ring, Freddy was taking the front yard where he was washed and dried off. Garrod handed Freddy's owner the cash while he was bragging about their now grand champion matchdog. Rex never moved again as Garrod picked him up out of the ring to lay him on the back of the truck. Freddy and his crew didn't stick around long, shaking every one hand before leaving. Riding with Garrod was his homeboys Ronald and Jazz. They usually helped him around his kennel, as well as helped him condition and buy dogs. They were just as surprised as Garrod was to see Rex handled so quickly. Not wanting to get pulled over with a dead dog on the back of the truck, Garrod pulled over in a wooded area and pulled Rex off the back of the truck, laying him out of eyesight. Jumping back inside his Silverado, Garrod made his way back to Horry County where he lived. Soon as he walked through the door, his wife Erica could tell by his facial expression that he had lost the match. Where's Rex? she asked while finishing up dinner. He didn't make it, Garrod said as he walked in the back bedroom. Following him into the room, Erica wanted to know more about what happened. Rex was her favorite dog in the kennel, especially after he brought home a total of 20 grand between two fights. Erica wasn't a fond of dogs at all until she met Garrod at a club in Florence, South Carolina a few years back. And after helping Garrod around the kennel here and there, she began to take liking of certain dogs on the yard. So to hear Rex had been killed was sad news to her as well. Sitting on the side of the bed with his head down, her man was more worried about finding another dog that could win money than the money he just lost. Later that evening, while cuddled on the couch with Erica, Garrod received a call from his boy Jazz. He found a guy in southern South Carolina that had some pit bulls that had a reputation of fighting for hours off natural wind with no conditioning. When he heard the news, Garrod told Jazz to let the guy know they were coming to check his kennel out the next day. Although Garrod had other dogs on his yard, Rex was the best he had, and if Rex got demolished the way he did, it was time to regroup. The next morning, Garrod, Jazz, and Ronald were on the highway heading south from Lake City, going to Augusta, South Carolina, to see what kind of dogs the old man had to offer. When they arrived to the address they were giving, they drove up to a gate that stopped them from entering the property any further. Calling the old man on the phone, Jazz told him they were at his residence at the security gate. Then suddenly the ten-foot-high steel electric fence opened up, 
letting the boys inside. As they slowly drove down the driveway to the parking area, Garad could see numerous dog houses off in the distance of his backyard. Their eyes were open wide as dollar pieces as they observed the scenery of the old man's yard. Exiting their car as the old man came out of his house, Jazz introduced himself being he was the person that spoke with him on the phone. James McElberry, the man said, as he reached out to shake the boy's hands. After properly introducing themselves, Garrod wanted to know what bloodline Mr. McElberry was running because he needed a new stud dog for his kennel. Walking into the large wood-gated backyard following behind the old man, Garrod's mouth dropped open when he saw how his kennel was set up. There was a light brown or what is called buckskin male, with a big head at the front of the kennel entrance. That's my old boy Mars right there. He's a pure red boy dog and one of my best studs on the yard, Mr. McElberry said as they continued to walk through. Finding out he was working the Frisco Chinaman dogs, Garad knew the man. Dogs would be hard biters, but he wasn't sure how game the dogs were because he heard so many stories about that strand of dog quitting in fights after about 45 minutes. Just like any other dog man, Mr. McElberry assured the boys his dogs were as game as they come. Walking past two black dogs, they reached a path that led to another, dark brown red nosy pit bull. This is the dog you're looking for right here, buddy. He is 75% red boy, and a quarter of that old Colby blued, Mr. McElberry said. Standing in front of the energetic bulldog, Garad looked closely at his physique seeing muscles bulge from his shoulders. The dog was barking nonstop as if he knew the guys were talking about him. Reaching down to pet the exotic bulldog, it was looking like they were going to be taking him back to Horry County. Jazz wanted to look around at the rest of the dogs, claiming he needed a male ready to put in the box. While Jazz and Ronald strolled through the yard, Garad and Mr. McElberry went inside his house to get the papers and registration for the dog that was named Deacon. Bulldog after bulldog, the guys walked past looking for that special one. When Garad and the old man came back out the house, Jazz still hadn't found one he wanted to buy. As the old man took Deacon off the chain and passed the leash over to Garad, the dog went crazy snarling and growling as he attempted to get at any dog he was close to. He was friendly as it can be with people and great with kids, but he would kill another animal. When they put him in the kennel crate on the back of the truck, the dog shook the box side to side as he tried to get out. Warning him not to let Deacon get close to any dog he cared for, Mr. McElberry stood in his yard waving the guys off as they drove away from his property. Chapter 2 While the guys were on their way back to Aner, South Carolina with Deacon, Garad's girlfriend Erica was about to get a surprise at the house. Little did she know there were three guys in her backyard about to steal Garad number one producing bitch from the kennel. Not only were they trying to steal the dogs, they were breaking into the house as well to see what they could find of value laying around. Knowing the Garad was gone out of town to buy a pit bull, the guys took their time making sure they got the right girl dog from the backyard before attempting to enter the house. The mastermind of the plan was named Larry, he was friends with Ronald. The night before the boys left to go see the Mr. McElberry, Ronald had told Larry he was riding out of town with Garad to check out some dogs. But Ronald didn't think Larry was going to come steal Garrod's dogs. Hearing the dogs out back in the kennel barking like crazy, Erica thought one of the dogs must have gotten loose. So she walked to the back porch and looked out to the yard. She didn't see anything out of the ordinary, so she attempted to turn around and walk back inside the house when suddenly Erica was grabbed from behind and put in the chokehold. Don't move, bitch, or I will break your fucking neck, Larry said as the guys he was with entered the back door of the house. Scared to death, Erica tried kicking and fighting to get loose, but Larry was too strong for her to get free from his grip. Covering her mouth so she couldn't yell, he put his pistol to her neck so she could feel the cold steel on her skin, calming down so she wouldn't get killed. Erica begged for her life while in Larry arms. Not staying in house but a few minutes, the other guys came out with a small bag with four pounds of cush inside. Pushing Erica down on the porch to her chest, Larry and his boys darted off into the woods where they had their car parked waiting. Not even realizing that the guys took any of the dogs, 
Erika went inside the house immediately calling Garo to inform him what had just took place. Still hours away from home, Garod told Erika to leave the crib and go to his sister's place until he got there. Driving as fast as he could without getting pulled over, Garod's sweaty hands gripped the steering wheel tightly as he made his way back to Aenor. When Garod pulled up in his yard, he slammed on brakes, jumping out of the truck, leaving the door opened as thick weed smoke spots seeped from out the vehicle. Jazz and Ronald followed behind as they reached the backyard. Coming out his back door pissed because he was robbed for his entire stash, Garod quickly went to the kennel to see his number one bitch Nina had been stolen from her chain spot. Yo, who the fuck knew we were leaving town? Garrod yelled to Jazz and Ronald. Not mentioning he told Larry they were going to get a dog, Ronald kept his mouth shut. Jazz was just as pissed as Garrod was being he spent so much time with the dogs. Taking Deacon off the back of the truck so he could bring him to the back with the rest of the pits, Jazz chained him up in Nina Old Spot. Garrod went inside the house grabbing his 9mm pistol from a well-stashed area and told Jazz to ride with him. Ronald was claiming he had to go handle a few things, so he left in his car. Garrod didn't think anything of it, because Ronald wasn't about the street life. Driving around Aner like a madman, Garrod called all his boys, informing them his dog was stolen, and he was offering a reward for her return. He never mentioned anything about being robbed as well, because whoever had the dog was the man he was looking for. While he was ripping and running through the countryside looking for his bulldog, Larry was in the outskirts of Georgetown, South Carolina, making money off the weed he took from Garrod and Erica. He wasn't into dogs and just stole Nina because he knew he could get big money for her. She was on a yard in Lake City, South Carolina, after being purchased by a guy named Sal. He was in the dog game deep, but didn't know Garrod who was up and coming. Sal was a big-time dope dealer that had a reputation of putting five figures or better on his dog matches. He had a grand champion that was known to kill dogs in less than 30 minutes, named Bull. And although Sal didn't know Garod, Garod had heard of Sal and his champion dog being Lake City, wasn't far from Aner. Days had gone by and he still hadn't heard anything about his Nina. She was a pure red boy dog Garod had purchased from an old dog. Man named Mr. Tenshaw. Garod sold her puppies for $500 each every time she had a litter but if he would have bred her to Deacon, he would get fifteen hundred easily. With all his weed gone and bills due, Garrod started thinking maybe buying Deacon wasn't the smartest thing to do. Chapter 3 While Garrod, Jazz, and Ronald were trying to find somebody to buy a few of the dogs off the yard to come back up, Erica was with one of her girlfriends, Megan, that just so happened to live in Lake City. Riding through the city as her stomach started to growl, Erica pulled over to McDonald's. At the same exact time, Megan received a call from her friend Tracy. She wanted Megan and Erica to stop by her house for a few minutes, claiming she wanted to show her something. Megan agreed, so after making sure their french fries were good and hot, they drove over to Tracy's place. Once they arrived on the other side of town, Erica pulled in Tracy Yard and parked. Seconds later, Tracy walked out the front door smiling from ear to ear. Getting out of the vehicle as she walked over to the car, Megan and Ursia was blinded by the sparkle from the ring on the finger. Tracy stuck out in their faces. Happy for her friend, Megan hugged her tightly as she congratulated her. This is where the game got interesting because Tracy's fiancé was Sal, the same Sal that had purchased Garrod's dog Nina from Larry. But the crazy part was that Erica thought she saw their dog Nina in the backyard, but she thought her eyes were playing tricks on her. When she and Megan drove off, Erica couldn't stop thinking about the dog she saw from the distance. For the rest of the evening, Erica thoughts kept drifting back to the dog she saw at Tracy House. She never told Megan what was on her mind, but it was obvious that she was thinking about something deep. Back in Aenor Garrod had come to the fact that he wasn't going to find Nina. After finding someone to buy three of his younger dogs, Garrod had enough money to get five pounds of triple OG Kush which allowed him to pay his bills, his new dog. Deacon was acting great on the yard, and with cash flow steady coming back in, he was ready to find a match for his so-called killer. Later that night, while at home fixing dinner over the stove, 
Erica mentioned to Garad about the dog she saw earlier that day. He thought it was far-fetched that it could be Nina that his wife saw at Tracy House, but he wanted to know more. Calling her friend Megan to see what Tracy's fiancé name was, Erica found out it was the guy Sal Garad had heard about with the killer dog from Lake City. His ears were open, and now he wanted to ride with his girl back to see the dog himself. The next morning, while he was out back feeding the dogs, Garad received a call from his boy Ronald. What's going on, bro? Did Randy call you? He asked Garad. Know about what? He claimed some guys from Chesterfield. South Carolina had a dog they wanted to fight at 50 pounds for 10 grand, Ronald stated. 10,000? Damn, I just got my bread back up. Do you think he will go any lower? Garad asked. I don't know, but I will ask the guy that told me about it. After getting off the phone with Ronald, Garad walked over to Deacon, who was tied in the center of the yard, to pet him up. The dog was full of energy and ran his chain spot back and forth so much he was beginning to make a trench around the haze area. You ready for some action, boy? Garrod asked the red pit bull as he rubbed his head and chest, as if he could understand what his owner was asking of him. Deacon wagged his tail back and forth while he jumped up and down on the chain. He was the kind of dog that never stopped moving, it seemed. When all the dogs were fed up and watered, Garrod got in his car and went to his homeboy jazz crib, which was a few miles away. Telling his boy what Erica told him, Garrod said he at least wanted to see the dog she was talking about. Jazz thought he was going on a wild goose chase, but was ready to roll to Lake City whenever he got ready. When Ronald finally called Garrod back about matching his dog into the boys from Chesterfield, he had good news. They agreed to match their dog for 7500 claiming it would be easy money. Ronald told the guys they needed to come down that Saturday to lock it in and put down the forfeit for the fight. The forfeit is in case anyone can't make the match or their dog is overweight. In this case, the was putting up two grand. Although Garraud didn't know the guy he was fighting against, Ronald did so. He was trusting that his homeboy people were straight. That shouldn't be a problem for Deacon since Mr. McElberry told him the dog's game box weight was 50 pounds. And even though Garrod hadn't seen him fight at all, he had confidence in the old man's word. Not knowing a single thing about the Chesterfield boy's dog, Garrod told Ronald to see what he could find out about one the hound so he could properly prepare. At the same time, Garrod was at Jazz Crib. Erica was sitting on the front porch of their house when a car passed. She thought she recognized. Five minutes went by and her brain was boggled because she couldn't figure out where she saw the car at before. Then, as she got up to go in the house, and hit her like a freight train. That's the same car that passed by her house about thirty minutes before. She was robbed days ago. That freaked Erica out as she walked inside, closing the door behind her. Calling Garad as she went in the kitchen, she peeped out of the blinds, but the car was gone. Where are you? she asked. Garad. Hearing the fear in his wife's voice, Garad hurried back home but the car never came back through by their crib the rest of the evening. Chapter 4 Eight weeks later, things were back to normal around Garad's place. He was about to find out what his deacon dog was all about. The Chesterfield boys came to town in two SUVs. Ronald had them to stop by his house and pick him up so they could meet up with Garad and go to the spot the match was going down at. Grabbing five grand from his stash before leaving his house, Garad had Jazz walk Deacon down the street to empty him out one last time. When they arrived at the match location, a few of Garad friends were standing around the empty pit, talking and smoking a blunt. Not wasting any time, both groups weighed and washed each other dogs as the rules implied. Deacon was weighing exactly 50 pounds. He was ripped from head to toe. Garrod and Jazz both spent time working. Deacon for the match throughout the weeks. Soon as the Chesterfield boys brought their dog near the box, Deacon began to scream. Garrod could barely hold him in his arms as he tried to keep him from getting excited. Deacon was focused on the other dog, like a missile locked in on his target. Handing the money to the referee as he stepped into the box, one of the Chesterfield boys held the dog they called Luke in the corner of the pit. Just like Deacon, 
he came in at the right weight, and the match was about to be on. As Garrod stepped over the wood box to enter the ring with Deacon in his arms, the dog Luke began to bark and attempt to break free from his handler. That made Deacon go crazy while Garrod gripped him tightly in the opposite corner. When the referee told the men to face their dogs, both hounds were ready for war. One of the guys with the Chesterfield crew blurted out from the outside of the ring, Let's get that money, Luke. That's when the referee instructed both men to release their dogs. Deacon darted out of Garrod's hands, hitting Luke like a locomotive as he instantly grabbed the chest area of his opponent. Pushing his mouth deeper into Luke's chest as he shook with all his strength, Deacon backed him in the corner. Luke was a very smart dog, biting Deacon around the stifle, causing him to release his chest hold. Soon as Luke was free, he went to work on Deacon face shaking the top part of his nose while back paddling around the box. That lasted about ten minutes as it was beginning to look like Deacon was getting frustrated that he could get Luke off of his nose. While the dogs were going at each other's throats for cash in Anor, Erica was in Florence, South Carolina doing some shopping. Stopping by the gas station before she came back home, Erica had to wait in line behind a guy who was buying lottery tickets. Getting a little impatient, she looked at her watch just before a tall, slender black guy walked in the store. Not paying the man attention, Erica took her phone from her pocketbook to see what Garrod was doing. At that very moment, the man standing behind her pulled a gun from his waist and attempted to rob the place. Telling everyone to empty their pockets while demanding the cashier to empty the safe and register, the man waved the gun around loosely. Instead of getting the money like the robber said, the young Spanish cashier ducked behind the counter as he pulled a small handgun and began shooting. Erica fell to the floor as the man shot his gun back at the cashier. The smell of gunpowder filled the store as seconds felt like hours. Not looking while he steadily squeezed the trigger, the robber ducked behind one of the aisles for cover. The man playing the lottery tickets was shot in the back of the shoulder when the shootout first kicked off. Seeing his only way out was to grab a hostage, the man ran up behind Erica, taking her up from the floor. The cashier held his fire as the robber put his gun to Erica's head. Claiming he would blow her brains out if he moved, the man tried walking out the door using Erica as a shield, but the cashier wasn't about to let him escape. Pointing his firearm at the robber and shooting, the cashier tried hitting him while he had a clear shot but missed. The robber then aimed at the cashier, shooting multiple rounds in his direction. Screaming as bullets whistled past her head. Erica tried to break free but was held by her hair as the man made it to the doorway. Able to look into his piercing black eyes as she was manhandled, Erica tried one more time to rip her arm away but was unsuccessful. That's when the cashier thought he had a clean shot and fired hitting Erica in the chest. Seeing he hit the wrong person, the young cashier stopped shooting to duck behind the counter. The robber let Erica go as sleep fell to the floor in pain. He broke off running out the door and disappeared into the city. Looking over the counter to see blood starting to puddle around the young lady, the cashier called 911 while trying to keep her awake. At the same time, about 50 miles away in Anor at the dogfight, things were looking bad for Garrod and his deacon dog. The Chesterfield boy's dog Luke had took total control of the fight since the 45-minute mark. Luke was biting Deacon so hard you could hear the grit sound of his teeth grinding against the bone. At times, Deacon would scream out while Luke was going to work on his legs, and although he was getting the shit beat out of him, each time Deacon came out the corner like he had a point to prove. When Garrod looked at his watch again, they were one hour and twenty minutes into the match. Deacon had holes in his shoulders that you could stick your thumb inside, but he was hanging in there with the brindle brown dog from out of town. After making a great handle grabbing his dog, taking him in the corner, Garrod tried to cool Deacon down because he was starting to overheat. It was a scratch, but Luke was in his corner appearing to be finished as he sat still between his owner's legs. When the referee told the guys to face their dogs, neither Pitt made a move toward the other. It didn't matter if Luke came out or not because it was Deacon's time to prove his gameness. Soon as Garrod released him to cross the line, Deacon fell to his face. He was more tired than all outdoors. Panting hard as he tried to take in fresh, clean air, Deacon gazed across the box at Luke, who was calmly sitting in his handler's hands. 
The referee started counting and was at four of a ten count when Deacon heard Garrod screaming for him to get up. With all the strength in his back legs, the dog Mr. McElberry said was game pushed his way across the box. Too tired to stand more than a second on his front legs, Deacon lounged at Luke, knocking him back against the wall in the corner. He made his scratch, and now it was Luke's turn. Seeing he was finished, Deacon gathered some energy to squeal in the corner, wanting to be released at Luke. And when the referee instructed the guy to release, Luke the pit bull turned away in an attempt to leave the fight. Picking the exhausted Deacon up and handing him to Jazz as he collected the cash from the referee, Garrod shook the Chesterfield boy's hands before blurting out, It was nice doing business with you. Putting their dog back in his crate so they could leave, he saw he had a missed call from Erica. But when he tried to call her back, she didn't pick up the phone. Little did Garrod know, but his celebration would be short-lived, because while he was cleaning Deacon off to put him back on the chain, his wife was in a Florence gas station bleeding out on the floor. The ambulance had finally arrived at the gas station, and the paramedics were doing their best to revive Erica, who was unconscious. The officers on the scene were interrogating the cashier while getting the camera footage of the robbery. Holding her cell phone in his hand, one of the cops answered when the contact name read Hubby across the screen. It was Garad, and when he heard the voice of a man answer his lady's phone, it instantly sparked a flame. But when the man speaking from Erica's phone said he was a Florence County police officer, and the woman that owned that phone had been shot in a gas station robbery attempt. Not believing what he was hearing, Garad asked the cop. Was she still alive? But the officer just told him that he needed to go to Florence McLeod Regional Hospital. Hanging up the phone as his heart dropped into his stomach, Garad grabbed his car keys off the dresser and left his house speeding towards Florence. Sweat dripped down the side of his head while his sweaty hands gripped the steering wheel ever so tightly. It was like a bad dream trying to keep calm when the love of your life was shot in another city. It took Garad a little over 15 minutes to reach to hospital where he parked and jumped out the car running towards the entrance. His blood pressure was elevating and his legs felt like they were getting too heavy to lift as he stormed through the front doors into the lobby. Chapter 5 Finding out Erica was in surgery at the time he left the receptionist's desk, Gerard could do nothing but wait in the lobby. After calling Jazz and Ronald while he was waiting to see the doctors, his boys said they were on the way to the hospital. Both of Erica's parents were dead, but she treated her Aunt Darlene like she was her mother, so Gerard called her as well. It wasn't long before she ran through the doors of the hospital emergency entrance into the lobby where Gerard was sitting. His eyes were filled with water, causing Darlene to think the worst as she yelled out. She's not dead, is she? Where's my niece? Darlene started getting loud in the lobby, demanding to see her niece. But she had to wait just as Garrod did. Before the doctor came out of the operating room, Garrod and Darlene were visited by two plain-clothes detectives explaining that they had an APB out on the guy that tried to rob the store. The officers tried to comfort the pair in the lobby as they waited. Then suddenly a man who appeared to be a doctor came walking towards the lobby. Are you the family of Ms. Williams? He asked Garrod and Darlene as he stood in front of them. Yes, she is my wife, and this is her aunt, Garrod answered. Soon as the doctor said the word, unfortunately... Darlene started crying out. Erica didn't make it due to heart failure, which was caused by the large 40 caliber bullet that ripped through her flesh and muscle. Feeling lightheaded, Garrod leaned back in his chair to keep from falling forward. Darlene buried her head in Garrod's chest as she cried her heart out. My only niece, my only niece, she said repeatedly as Garrod held her in his arms. Unable to soak in what the doctor had just told him, Garrod trembled in anguish as his friends Jazz and Ronald came through the hospital doors. The bad news hit them just as hard as Jazz claimed he needed to take a walk to get some air. It was killing him to see his boy in that situation, knowing how happy Erica and Garrod were together. After leaving the hospital that night, Garrod sat in his house alone grieving over his love. 
He wasn't a drinker, but he tried drowning his pain with a half pint of whiskey. Jazz, Ronald, and numerous friends tried calling to comfort him in his loss, but he wouldn't answer the phone. Holding a picture of Erica in his hand, as tears dropped onto the glass picture frame, Garrod yelled out to the Lord for help. Drowning in drunkenness, he began to talking to himself. And when he attempted to get up from the couch, highly intoxicated, he stumbled forward, losing his balance and hitting the floor. The sound of someone bamming on his door is what woke him up the next morning. Still laying on the floor, Garrod slowing made his way to his feet. His head was hurting from all the alcohol he consumed the night before. And when he opened the door, Jazz was on his porch with another bottle of liquor in his hands. What's up, bro? You okay? Motherfucker's been calling you since last night, he said as Garrod led him inside the house. Nah, man, I'm fucked, yo. No need for me to lie. Some crackhead-ass nigga took my wife from me, Garrod blurted as he flopped down on the sofa. Smelling the alcohol reeking from his skin and the empty bottle on the floor, Jazz could see his boy didn't need any more to drink. He tried talking to Garrod but only got hard stares and cold silence. Realizing he wasn't leaving the house or being social, Jazz decided to leave and come back later. While he sat alone in his house, Garrod couldn't stop thinking about all the good times he and Erica had while she was living. Nothing mattered to him anymore. And for the first time in his life, he felt helpless and left for dead. As the days went by, Erica was buried. The weeks following her funeral were extra hard for Garrod, who was starting to feel like he was breaking down mentally. The only thing that even made sense to him was spending time with his dogs. He was beginning to see the real meaning of why dogs are considered man's best friend. Deacon had healed up from the fight against Luke and was looking good on his chain as he jumped up and down, wagging his tail. After telling Mr. McElberry how the dog he sold him won his first match, Garrod had to tell him the bad news about his wife. Although the old man didn't know Erica, he gave Garrod his condolences. He explained to Garrod how his wife died years back and left him an emotional wreck. He and Garrod spoke for hours. And when Mr. McElberry was done, Garrod was feeling a little better inside. One Saturday, not long after his wife passed away, Garrod got a call from Erica's cousin, Shamela. She was in town from Miami, Florida, and wanted to stop by being she hadn't seen him in so long. Straighten up the house a bit before she arrived, he figured she was with her husband as before. But when Shamela knocked on his front door, she was alone. And when he swung his door open, his deceased wife's caramel complexion, thick hips, with a fat-ass cousin, was looking into his eyes. Well, can I come inside? she asked. For the first fifteen minutes after coming inside the house, she didn't mention her dead cousin once. Claiming she and her husband were on the outs, Shamela asked, Garud could she stay there for a few days until things blew over. Insisting she would stay out of his way, she said divorce was intimate for her. And after she told Garud everything she caught her husband doing, he was surprised, especially since Shamela's man didn't seem like the type to do what he did. And after a long conversation, she was granted access to the back bedroom where she took her suitcase. While Garrod was cooking something quick to eat, Shamela took a shower and came into the living room, dressed rather loosely. Wearing a pink t-shirt that stopped at her Coke bottle hips, her boy shorts had no problem arousing Garrod as he stood over the stove. What are you, some type of dog breeder or something? She asked as HSE walked in the kitchen. Well, I got a few. Nigga, you got more than a few. When I got out the car, it sounded like you had a dog shelter in your backyard, she responded. What, you don't like dogs? He asked. Nah. Actually, I love dogs. What breed do you have? Oh, let me guess. Pit bulls. You know it. Do you fight your dogs? Shamela asked, looking him directly in his eyes. Nah. I don't do any fighting, Garrod answered, knowing he was lying his ass off. Sitting at the table as they ate, Garrod was getting the feeling that Shamela was pushing up on him. How could she be in her dead first cousin house and not even give her condolences one time? It was like she didn't care or was waiting for her opportunity at her cousin man. Although she had a 
I don't give a damn attitude. She did ask Garad not to let their Aunt Darlene know she was staying over there. Claiming she would tell her husband where she was, and he would come looking for her, Shamela said she didn't want to see him anymore. Garod didn't want to get involved with her marriage problems, but he knew if Erica was living, she would let Shamela stay at their house. After eating, Garod poured up a glass of wine for the both of them as the conversation led deep into the night. Chapter 6 About three o'clock in the morning while he was hard asleep, Garod was awakened by the sound of dogs barking. Hurrying out of his bed while grabbing his thirty-eight special, he went to the back door. Quietly opening the door as he stepped out on his patio, Garod could see the dogs at the back of the kennel, barking at something or someone in the woods. Shamela was still asleep in the bed while he was creeping behind his shed to get a better look at what the dogs were barking at. That's when it happened. Someone jumped the fence and attempted to grab one of the dogs of the chain. Yo, what the fuck you doing? Garrod yelled as he aimed his gun. Stopping in his tracks when he heard a voice, the man let go of the dog collar, pulling a handgun from his waist as he tried to jump the fence to escape firing one shot from his revolver that was aimed at the man as he jumped back into the shadows, Garrod ran into the kennel entrance. By that time, the guy stealing the dog was nowhere to be found. He vanished into the woods empty-handed. Garrod checked all his dogs, making sure they were there before going back into the house. As he passed through the den area, he was met in the hallway by Shamela, who was wearing red lacet lingerie. What's going on? I heard gunshots she asked, standing in front of Garod as her hard wearing. Explaining that someone was trying to steal dogs from the kennel, Garod didn't give Shamela the attention she seemed to have wanted as he went to his bedroom. Calling his boy Jazz to tell him about the dog thief, Garod laid back on his pillow as he flipped through the television channels. Just as his eyes were about to close shut, he heard the sound of his room door opening. It was Shamela. Walking towards his bed as her oily brown skin glistened off the light from the TV, Garod could see she had other motives. What's up you know you don't need to be in here? He asked as she climbed into his bed, putting her finger over his lips. Not saying much more as she gently brushed her tongue around his belly button, Garod closed his eyes while Shamela gave him a surprise he wasn't expecting. The next morning when Garod woke up, Shamela wasn't in the bed. Lying under his super comfy blanket watching television, he figured she went back in the back bedroom, but when he finally got up, he realized she had left the house. Her car was gone and she wasn't answering her phone, thinking she may have had a change of heart and went back to her husband. Garrod closed the door and went back to bed. Later the afternoon, while out picking up a few bags of dog food, Garrod was approached by a man from behind. It was Shamela's husband, Carl. What's up, big dog? How you been? He asked with a rather serious look on his face. Can't complain, my man. How's the family? Garrod asked. Everything is good. Everyone is well, Carl responded, appearing as if he desperately wanted to tell Garrod something. Besides what came from his mouth, Carl gave him a stiff dap and hard gaze as he turned and walked away. After leaving the store, Garrod decided to stop by his boy Jazz Crib, and although he had a wet night with Shamela, things weren't adding up right. He noticed how Carl was sizing him up and the harsh looks he gave him. He was getting the feeling Shamela's husband knew she was at his house last night, and she still wasn't answering her cell phone. Problems with Carl is what Garrod didn't want. Carl was a big-time player from North Charleston, South Carolina. He was connected with some heavy dope boys from Panama City, Florida. Word was that they would kill anyone that got in the way of their money, and Carl was their number one money man in South Carolina. So Garrod knew if he found out his lady was getting smashed the night before, Carl would have him killed. When he told his boy Jazz what happened the night before, he warned Garrod that he was playing on dangerous ground and needed to watch Carl. Hearing how Carl approached Garrod in the store, Jazz knew that wasn't the last time they would see him. Changing the subject, Garrod started talking about the kennel and how good Deacon looked in his match against the Chesterfield boys. Jazz agreed and thought they should start looking for his second match being he didn't suffer any major injuries from the match with Luke. Seeing how game, Deacon was 
Jazz was willing to put ten grand of his own money up for his next fight. Getting up with their partner Ronald, the boys decided to have a cookout at Garad Place on the back patio. Jazz invited a few ladies as well as some guys he knew from Conway and Myrtle Beach. Ronald was doing the cooking while Garad was handling in a few things around the yard that needed to be tended to. Just as the smell over barbecue began to reek in the air, the boys got the first guest, but it wasn't who they was expecting. Stepping out of her red Maxima dress to kill was Shamela, and she wasn't alone because getting out of the passenger seat was a model-shaped, pretty brown-eyed chick named Kayla. She was from North Carolina but moved down to Myrtle Beach a few years ago. Best friends, the girls walked up the steps to the porch to knock on the front door as the scent of good eating was creeping into their nostrils. Damn, it smells like someone is cooking good, Kayla said to Shamela. On the back patio, Garod and the boys didn't know they had company on the front porch. And after no one came to the door, Shamela decided to walk around back to see if Garod was at his dog kennel. I see we showed up at the right time, Shamela said as she stepped up onto the back patio. Surprised to see her back again, Garod grabbed a couple porch chairs, sitting them out for the ladies. Never seeing her friend Kayla before, Shamela introduced her to Garod, Jazz, and Ronald. Unlike Shamela, her friend Kayla had something in common with Garod. She was the girlfriend of a big-time dogfighter in North Carolina, so she loved pit bulls. It wasn't long before a few of Jazz's friends pulled up with a couple bottles of Remy Martin and whiskey. The party was just about to crank up when Kayla thought she saw Shamela's boyfriend, Carl's car, pass by Garad House and turn the curb. Hearing that had Shamela paranoid looking over her shoulders, as if she just robbed a bank. She never said anything to the boys about who Kayla thought she saw. And at the end of the night when everyone was half drunk, stomachs full and about to leave, Shamela was scared to drive away from the house. She never saw her husband's car with her own eyes, but she had a gut feeling that he was somewhere close by, waiting for her to leave. And her intuitions were right, because soon as she and Kayla were out of sight of Gerard's house, she saw a car speeding up behind her in the rearview mirror. Her heart raced as the lights got closer and closer. Unable to outrun the car without getting in a wreck herself on the curvy roads, Shamela let off the gas, reducing her speed down to 45 miles per hour. Then suddenly the car behind her attempted to pull up beside their vehicle. That's when she got a clear look at the car. It was Carl and he appeared to be pissed off. Looking over at his car as the passenger window rolled down, Shamela locked eyes with her husband. Fire burned in his pupils like oil in the Iraqi deserts. At that moment, Shamela tried speeding past it him but was, ran off the road into the woods. Chapter 7 Radiator busted. The girls lay dazed in the badly wrecked car. There were no other cars on the road besides them, and Carl was hitting a U-turn just up the street to come back and finish them off. When he pulled up, Carl jumped out of his car with his pistol in his hand. He calmly walked over to the car, being careful not to get burnt by the water gushing out the radiator. This just ain't our lucky day, he said to Kayla, who was dazed on the passenger side. Aiming his pistol at her skull, Carl called out to the girl to get her attention. Barely able to move her head, Kayla looked at him, then looked away. Bitch, I never liked your whore ass anyway, Carl said as he squeezed the trigger twice. Falling over in the seat as blood flowed from her head, like the Niagara Falls, Kayla died instantly. Carl ran to the driver's side and opened the door, taking Shamela from her seat. Unable to stand on her own, Carl helped his injured wife to the passenger seat of his car and drove off. Shamela was so out of whack, she didn't know where she was at when she did come to her scenes, a tad bit she was too weak to do anything but moan. While Carl was taking Shamela to who knows where, Jazz and Ronald were cleaning things up around the house. Garad thought it was odd the girls weren't answering their phones, so he continued to call long after his friends left, but only got the operator. When Jazz and Ronald rolled out, they didn't even notice Shamela Carr wrecked in the shadows of the dark on the side of the road. Kayla's body laid in the front seat as Rigmarole stiffened her limbs. Not even the cars riding down the road throughout the night spotted the badly damaged vehicle at the edge of the woods. 
The road was so dark, and the car was in the woods just far enough for the rear lights to be covered by the bushes. The next morning, Garad was up early when he noticed a police car pass B, his crib. By the time he made it to his front door, another patrol car passed by his place. Thinking the cops were going to the neighborhood miles down the street that was known to be a crack spot, Garad realized he was wrong when he backed out his yard and saw flashing lights a little over a mile past his house. Having to drive in that direction anyway, he slowly made his way down the street, approaching the emergency vehicles. Cops were everywhere. Some were around the car in the woods, while others were walking along the side of the street looking for clues. Driving slow enough to look off into the woods where the wrecked car was is when Garad could see the back of Shamela's Dodge Charger. What the fuck? he said under his breath as he passed by the scene. Soon as Garad turned the corner and was away from the cops, he pulled over at the gas station and called Jazz. Yo, man, I just passed a Shamela car in the woods with yellow tape around it. Dog, it was so many cops out there, and I'm dirty so I couldn't stop, he said. Bro Shorty was saying something about Shamela had to leave because of some crazy shit. She really didn't go into details, but I know it probably had something to do with her husband, Jazz responded. It didn't take long to come to the conclusion that things had gone horribly to the left. Garod tried once more to reach Shamela's cellular, but it was turned off. Later that afternoon, while he and Jazz were out in the kennel vaccinating all the dogs, Garod received a call from a private number. When he answered, nobody said anything. Although he could hear a little rumbling in the background, nobody said a thing. Then suddenly, whoever was on the other line hung up the phone in his ear. Unable to concentrate after he received that phone call, Garod went inside the house arming himself with his pistol before coming back out to finish the kennel work. And after he told his boy about his strange and stalkerish phone call, Jazz was ready to go out and find Carl. Although he wasn't for sure about who was on the other end of that creepy call, he knew it had to be Carl, or someone he was affiliated with. But unlike his friend, who wanted to load up the guns and go hunting, Garrod wanted to lay low as if he was running from someone. Staying around his crib for the remainder of the evening, Garrod kept his pistol close. Jazz left insisting he come along, but the boy wanted to play close to home plate, 